robot engineer at Savvy Oak. I've been with the company for a little bit over a year now. My background is a PhD in robotics, mainly in sort of path planning uh, area. Um, today I was going to talk about what Savvy Oak's about, where we're going, where we see our product going. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what it took to get our product to market in the two years that we've been going and I'll talk a bit about what is actually in the product, what the main subsystems are. Uh, and talk a little bit about the challenges that we have faced to this point and continue to face with robotics and, and trying to do a service robot. So you might just get to hear the like cool little soundtrack and stuff here. That might be as good as we get. Over the last five years, new sensors have made it possible to make robots that make a difference in the world. There's actually a lot of robots in logistics. There's been robot arms building cars for 50 years. But what's new now is that we can go from behind the cages and factories out around people in places like the robot center. The robot's designed to deliver things from the front desk to a person. In general, it can take things from any place to any place. But what we do in the hotel is when somebody calls and says, I forgot my toothbrush or could I have a couple extra towels, the front desk staff puts the towel or the toothbrush into the robot. So that would actually do anything. Right, I'll keep going while this is going on. Um, this way. I could put it up here. Oh, and you can zoom in later. <laughs> yeah, that'll work. All right, uh, so we were founded, maybe I should just come in front so I can see it or... You, can you? Can I just come around here so I, I can see what I'm talking about? Right, so we were founded in August of 2013. We have a really funny name, so Savvy and Oak, it's a pun on smart tree. That comes from the fact that our seven founders were all members of Willow Garage, which was the privately funded robotics research lab that you might have heard of. They brought us ROS, the robot operating system, the big open source robotics software project, and the PR2 robot, amongst a bunch of other things. Can I just show this? Sorry. It's doing something. Oh, no. I think it's going to work. It's telling you, showing you all my text. It's shutting up. <laughs> Swing it. I don't know, it's detected something. Oh, oh, it should be smart actually, right? No, I think it's yeah. No? Okay, I guess it should be I don't know, now we're stuck on my notes page though. <laughs> All right, um, where was I? Uh, we started, we're a venture-backed company, we started with seven people, we're now a team of 15. So we have mechanical engineers, industrial designers, electrical engineers, two types of sort of software engineers, people like me who write stuff mainly in ROS. We have a web team as well who write software that goes on the tablet on the robot, which is a really important part of how the, the robot communicates its intent. And also uh, we have a web level sort of shared autonomy interface, which they do. Good. Um, we also have a business team, we have a financial controller, we have an office manager, so we're, we're 15. Um, our product, we, we make one robot, it's called Relay. It's been through a whole bunch of prototyping iterations, but we got our first one to market, into the market, into a hotel in August of last year. So it took us one year from absolutely nothing to a working, making money, well, being paid to have in the hotel robot. Um, we, so you can't see very well, but our alpha prototype looked like this. We made six of them. They were mainly 3D printed. <coughs> then in April, we launched our beta version of the robot. So it's a bit squatter, it's sleeker. Uh, it incorporates some of the stuff we learned in the first, from the first six months of alpha oper operation. Um, and uh, we are planning to build 50 of those by the end of this year. Uh, operationally, we passed the 1,000 kilometer in deliveries in hotel mark in July. We've now done well over 7,000 deliveries in hotels. 
Um, we're in seven hotels, six of which are in the Bay Area, one in LA. We're expanding to New York, Florida, South Carolina in the next couple of months. We, we hotels in the Bay Area? Uh, mm. If you would like to go see the robot. We, yeah, our definitely. first hotel was in a loft in Cupertino. There is one in the loft in Newark, which is probably a bit closer to you guys. Uh, we have one at the Crown Plaza in Milpitas, uh, one at the Grand in Sunnyvale. I'm starting to run out. One uh, at the Holiday Inn Express in Redwood City, I think, is where we are at. That's only five. I can't remember where the last one is. Um, but yeah, we're, we're currently exploring opportunities outside of hotels as well. So in the service sector, we're trying to get the robot into hospitals or schools or elder care facilities, that kind of thing. Um, so I put this, this slide in, it's sort of like our mission statement to kind of clarify why we're making the product we're making and where we want to go in the future. So everybody at our company kind of believes in the power of robots to make people's lives better. It's a pretty, pretty big mission statement type thing. Um, but we really see this, this, this product that we make now, a delivery robot, as like a, the first step in what will be a really long road to, towards getting towards making robots that can really help people so that they can, can operate in your home and can help elderly people or disabled people have better lives. Um, so that's where we're going. We think this is the first step. Uh, it's proving the market, that there is a market for robotics. It's uh, getting people used to having robots around. And from our perspective, it's helping us learn a lot of stuff which is going to be channeled back into making bigger, smarter, not necessarily bigger, but smarter, more capable robots in the future. So we're using it as a big learning experience and hopefully, you know, selling something along the way. Um, another thing that we really believe in is open source software. So we have a, a sort of strong heritage with Willow Garage and contributing to the Ross project. We leverage it very heavily in what we do now and we try and contribute back wherever we can. Um, we're targeting the services industry with our robot. Uh, there's a couple of reasons why we do that. Um, it's traditionally been an area where people haven't tried to deploy robots. So at the moment, there are around 15 million robots in people's houses. They mainly take the form of you know, floor cleaning robots like Roombas. They're traditionally pretty dumb. They're really safe. They do their job really well. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got industrial robots. So they tend to be expensive arms. They often are in cages. You don't see people around them. Uh, we're going for this kind of sweet spot in the middle we still have to deal with having people around, but we're also aided by things like ADA compliance reg regulations, which sort of put some constraints on what the environments that the robot's going to have to operate in uh, can be. So you have things like a ramp has to, can, can only have a, a certain incline or the gap in the elevator can only be so big. So we think these service environments are kind of primed to try and deploy robots right now. A lot of other people have thought the same things. Uh, there's a, a bunch of other companies that are making robots for the service industry. We have like tech, there's a couple also doing hospitality robots, tech medics in Singapore. Uh, there's a hotel in Japan, which got a lot of publicity a couple of months ago for making all of its staff robots, including a T-Rex manning the front desk. <laughs> um, in the Bay Area, you have Nightscope making robots for security. Uh, you also have fellow robotics who have deployed their Oshbot at Orchard Supply Hardware in San Jose, I think, which will guide you to whatever you need to find in the hardware store. So there's a lot of other people sort of operating around this, this sector. It proves that it's kind of the, a, a good time to go into that area. Um, the, the challenge with making a service robot, robot, though, is that there's a hell of a lot more involved than just building a robot. Uh, in our hotel deployment right now, for example, um, the robot, it just does delivery, right? It goes from point A to point B. But going from point A to point B in a hotel means taking the elevator. Our robot doesn't have an arm, so when it gets to your door, it can't knock, it has to call you on the phone. Uh, it's to, to do, to use the elevator, to use the phone, we're, d we're relying on being able to have either a Wi-Fi connection or an LTE connection, so we have this dependence on the hotel's existing infrastructure to some degree. Um, occasionally things go catastrophically wrong and uh, at that point we have uh, a shared autonomy level like maybe one percent of the time right now someone has to get involved remotely rescue the robot send it back to the dock we have to interface with that as well and then you have the people sort of factor as well 
So we have hotel staff that need to be able to use the robot. When we go into a hotel and do our first deployment, we train people, but hotel staff turn over pretty quickly. So you have to design the robot so that someone who's never used it before can easily just walk up to it, key in a pin, load stuff in and know what to do. Similarly, guests uh, ring the front desk and ask for more towels or something. They have no idea that it's going to be a robot that arrives at their door. They're expecting it to be some kind of pimply teenager or something running it up to their room, right? <laughs> so you have to make that, you have to design the experience from the time the, the person in the room gets the call to opens the door, open, the robot opens its lid. It has to be really seamless and sort of intuitive and that's been a really kind of core part of our design and something that we think about really heavily at our company. Um, this sort of needing to incorporate all these competing factors has played greatly into the way we have designed our system. You can think of our, our robot system as being like a four layer hierarchy. You've got the hardware of the robot itself, there's software that runs on the robot, there's this infrastructure level that we have to deploy to the hotels so that we can use elevators and phones, and then we have this top level in the cloud which allows us to do remote monitoring. So our hardware, you can't really see particularly well, but we went through a whole bunch of prototypes before arriving at our current beta form. Um, we prototyped a whole bunch of stuff in foam core initially just to work out how high the robot should be, how, what diameter, what power the motors are. We expected it, we ex experimented with a couple of different bases. Uh, we moved sensors around. We tried one camera. We tried two cameras. We initially started with no tablet, but you need to be able to interact with the robot. Uh, we did all kinds of prototyping with how do you actually put stuff in the robot, what's going to work well. Uh, eventually we graduated from foam core to an MDF, like a skinless robot, uh, which we did a lot of sort of user studies with. And then we arrived at the 3D printed alpha, which went into hotels. Along the way we also did a bunch of safety testing with the robot, so we flew it out to um, Phoenix and we drove it at crash test dummies to work out um, how fast the robot can drive into you if it's out of control and still not bruise you. And we use that to inform like the firmware limits of the robot. We have some pretty funny videos of that too. Um, from a hardware perspective, this is what our robot now looks like. Uh, going from the bottom up, we've got an active bumper. Uh, we have our own sort of custom drivetrain in there. We've got an LED ring around the bottom, which hotels usually like to customise to match their decor. Uh, we have a, a laser which we use for localization and obstacle avoidance. It's a 25 meter, 25 meter range, 240 degree field of view. Uh, we have a sort of laptop level power compute on the robot. Um, we have 4G, 4G LTE and Wi-Fi connections on it. Um, our payload is a bin about so high you can fit probably three hotel towels in it. It's got all sorts of inserts that allow you to lay out toothbrushes and drinks, even carry coffee nicely. Um, at the top of the robot, underneath that visor there, we have two 3D cameras. Um, and then we have the lid, which is a locking mechanism. So from the point where the hotel staff enter items into the bin and close it to the point where it gets to your hotel room and detects the door opening, it's locked. No one can pry it open in the elevator. Um, when we designed the robot, we kept sort of five things in mind. Safety, usability, ergonomics. So the robot's designed such that someone in a wheelchair can still reach in and get stuff out of the bin. Um, capacity, we did a bunch of user studies with um, hotels to work out what size the robot should be to carry the stuff that they need to be delivered to rooms. And brain integration. So if you go visit one of the hotels that has our robot, they'll all look slightly different from this because we allow them to put their own custom wrap around the robot or change the LED to match their brand and give it a name. <coughs> Excuse me. Moving up a level, we have the software that runs on the robot. You can kind of view this as being in two parts. We've got the ROS software, so that, that is kind of anything that is to do with getting the robot from point A to point B. And then we have user interface level software, which basically interfaces not only to the elevators, the phones, or the automatic doors that might be in the hotel, <clears throat> but also drives what's displayed on the tablet on the screen. So if you're unfamiliar with ROS, it's basically this huge ecosystem of contributors around the world uh, that contribute to this big open source uh, project. ROS provides you with the sort of basic plumbing to pass information between the processes that you need to run on a robot to get it to navigate. It gives you a bunch of 
of tools for like visualization, for troubleshooting your network, for doing logging. Uh, and it also provides basic capabilities both at the driver level and at the algorithmic level. So if you buy a new laser, you can usually just grab someone else's driver and plug it into your robot immediately. Ross does that for you. Or you can just download a path planning algorithm and that kind of thing. So we use ROS pretty heavily. Um, as we've gone along the last two years, we've swapped out the bits of ROS that don't work particularly well for us and built new, new capabilities. But it was enough to get us prototyping and going really quickly in the early stages. So we owe a lot to ROS. Um, <coughs> this is just a video of our nav system in action. This was uh, our robot on stage at Intel's developer forum delivering a Coke to Intel's CEO. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see what's sort of going on in the ROS Arviz uh, visualization, the map, the path planning, what the sensors see. And on the right-hand side, you've got what it's seeing in its RGB cameras. Uh, running out of time. So our 